Let's have a look at VSP Chaos today. This project announced some pretty impressive numbers and we will have a closer look at them today. Spyros, who has a lot of experience with powerful turbo engines, made clear that this is a Greek project. They design and produce in Greece, they want Greek staff and suppliers. Let's look at the engine first. Small sports car manufacturers that built their first car would usually start with an existing engine of a bigger car brand, like Koenigsegg did with Audi and Ford engines. But the Chaos uses a new and unusual turbocharged 4 liter V10 engine with 3000 horsepower, 1984 Nm of torque and 12200 RPM maximum. That's 750 horsepower per liter. Usually road cars have around 200 horsepower per liter, Formula 1 has around 500. Turbocharged 4 liter engines are usually V8s because manufacturers like to use half a liter of capacity per cylinder across their portfolio. So why would SP go for a 4 liter V10? More cylinders mean less capacity per cylinder and you can design the engine with the same bore but less stroke, which gives you more RPM. We will check if this is the case in a minute. The more RPM I have for a given power, the lower is the torque, which keeps the drivetrain light. But even with 12,200 RPM, SP still needs almost 2,000 Nm to reach 3,000 horsepower. That's a lot to take for the drivetrain, and since they want to use a dual clutch gearbox, it will be interesting to see which one they are using. But let's stay with the engine for now. The compression ratio is with 12.3 extremely high for a turbocharged engine. For comparison, Koenigsegg is using a compression ratio of around 10. 12 is the compression ratio of the high revving, naturally aspirated Lexus LFA. Engines with high compression ratios don't need much boost to increase power by a decent amount, as we know from the Gambala Mirage or the turbocharged Lambos but ideally you want a lower compression ratio to be able to use more turbo boost and reach more overall power. Spyros gives us the capacity and the mean piston velocity of the engine, so we can work out bore and stroke from this. Overall capacity is 3955.8 cubic centimeters for 10 cylinders. So each cylinder has 395 cubic centimeters. The volume of a cylinder is pi times r square times h, in our case pi times half bore square times stroke. The mean piston velocity is calculated with v equal to s over t, in our case velocity equals stroke divided by time. Maximum engine speed is 12200 rpm, that is 203 revolutions per second. So one revolution takes 0.005 seconds and half a revolution takes 0.0025 seconds. We already have our mean piston speed with 29.6 meters per second. And by the way, that's a pretty high value. Usually you want to try to stay below 20 meters per second to avoid any pressure losses. Audi had a lot of problems to develop its long stroke high revving engine with more than 25 meters per second mean piston speed, which resulted in engines having a lot less power than stated. But back to the chaos. We can now calculate the stroke and get 72.8 millimeter. Because we know the capacity of each cylinder, we can now work out the bore dimension, 83.2 millimeters. So we have more bore than stroke which is normal for a high revving engine. This bore is very similar to the 5.2 liter Audi Lambo V10, which has 84.5 mm, but of course this one has more stroke because it has more capacity. With these dimensions we can now roughly work out how long this engine is. Let's assume a cylinder wall of 5 mm between each cylinder because of the high power output and we get a length of 436 mm for the cylinders alone. This Chaos engine has one chain for the camshafts and one chain for the oil pump, as far as we can see on the crankshaft picture, just like the Audi engine. And the Audi engine with similar bore is 685 mm long overall, so my guess would be that the Chaos engine is pretty similar. But there are more interesting details we can see at the crank. 
It's a split pin design. A 10 cylinder engine has a 72 degree firing gap, but the engine has 90 degree bank angle. That means you need to compensate these 18 degree with the split pin design to have a smooth engine. But because you reduce the cross section, this weakens the crankshaft. So strong turbocharged engines are usually V8s, because they don't have this problem. Of course, you can also go with the common pin design and accept the irregular ignition gap of 90 degree, 54 degree, 90, 54, 90, 54, like today's R8, Huracan or the Viper. But this gives you vibrations that you don't want on a 3000 horsepower car. So it's interesting they went for a split pin design on an engine with almost 2000 Newton meters. Next thing to note is the unique design. On high revving engines, you try to design the crankshaft as smooth and as aerodynamic as possible to avoid any additional resistance. Yes, there is also aerodynamics in the crankcase. Or you vacuum the whole crankcase and you don't have this problem. So it's a bit of a surprise to see such a non-aero design on an engine with such high revs. Also you see the bigger counterweights at the front and smaller ones towards the gearbox, because you have less vibrations there. But there is more that we can take from this crankshaft picture. We can work out the firing order. 5 and 10 cylinder engines have a crankshaft that looks like a star from the front. For a V10 every pin has two opposite cylinders. So we can take the following from the picture. Cylinders 1 and 6 are here. Here are 2 and 7, 3 and 8, 4 and 9, and here are 5 and 10. We can now draw the cylinder heads and turn this crankshaft. We start with cylinder 1. The only cylinder that is available for ignition 72 degree later is cylinder 6. Another 72 degree later we could fire either 5 or 8. To avoid vibrations and to get an even firing gap within one bank, we always choose bank 1 and then the partner on bank 2. So we continue with 510, 27, 38, 49. And that, not surprisingly, is the same firing order that Lambo and Audi use, a common V10 firing order. Now let's look at packaging. For a mid-engine car, you can position the gearbox in front of the engine between the passengers like Aventador and Chiron. This gives you more freedom at the back to design a massive diffuser and reduces the yaw moment of inertia, because the heavy components are closer to the center of gravity. Or you position the gearbox behind the engine, like R8 and Huracan, which allows you to have both passengers sitting very close to each other, which in return reduces the greenhouse width and hence frontal area. Judging by the chaos pictures, the small distance between the seats suggests that the gearbox is behind the engine. Since the engine is sitting in the middle of the car, and as a dry sump engine super low, the prop shaft cannot run straight in the center. It needs to have angles and joints, just like the R8. But the Audi is only sending 15% of its 560 Nm to the front, so 84 Nm. Since the Chaos should have all-wheel drive with 35% of torque going to the front, that means that you need to send around 700 Newton meters from the very back of the car along the engine and through the tight tunnel to the front. Not impossible, but a challenge. And heavy. If we think about cooling of this turbocharged car with two to three times the power of other hypercars, it's surprising to only see such small air intakes. And it looks like the tight body doesn't allow for some internal ducting. So if it has the power SP states, it looks like it doesn't have it for long. And that brings us to aerodynamics. Let's do a quick comparison with the Bugatti Chiron and the Koenigsegg Jesko Absolute. The Chaos should reach 100 km per hour in 1.55 seconds. The rear-wheel drive Jesko in 3 seconds and the all-wheel drive Bugatti in 2.4 seconds. They reach 300 in 7.1 seconds, 10.5 and 13.1 seconds. If we draw this in a diagram, we can see that the Jesko line stays pretty steep even at higher speeds, which means that the driving resistances are not too strong. In other words, low drag, which is true because the Jesko Absolute has a drag coefficient of 0.278. 
The shear run, on the other hand, gets to 100 quicker, but needs much longer to reach 300, although the power output of both cars is similar. So this points to higher drag, which is true because the shear run has a drag coefficient of 0.35. For the chaos, we have to say that, first of all, you need to have an average acceleration of 1.83 g and tires that can do that to reach 100 km per hour in 1.55 seconds. It then reaches 300 after 7.1 seconds, which gives us a line that is flatter than the Yesco's line, but steeper than the Chiron line. So the Chaos's drag should sit somewhere between 0.28 and 0.35. In general, the Chaos looks pretty similar to the Ferrari Enzo to me. And now let's have a look at the front of the car. First of all, it's interesting to see something that looks like a pre-2019 Formula 1 wing at the car. This upper furniture was used in F1 to create outwash for the uncovered front wheels to push the front wheel wake outboard. But the elements at the chaos are pretty straight, and at the sides, downstream of the wing, is an air curtain which does the opposite thing, and keeps the flow close to the wheel. The front wing has five flaps with pretty aggressive angles. If we look from above, we can see that the front is designed for the air to flow through the body between front wheels and chassis like an LMP prototype, which is great. I'm just not sure how much through flow is possible with these five front wing flaps blocking the way. There is a big outlet in the center which could compensate the smaller cross section of the outlet or could be for an additional radiator at the front. The side intakes could be important for the intercoolers, but with the disruptions at the side I'm not sure how much clean air they will get. At the back we see a massive diffuser with a pretty high separation line if we compare this with the Yesco or McLaren P1. Also we can see two massive turbochargers, which is a bit surprising because the compression ratio of the car is already very high and these turbos suck the air without any filter directly from the hot engine bay. There are no spoilers or wings, but if this big diffuser is working, that should be enough to keep it on the road. Let's have a look at the underside of the car. We can see a very long splitter with something that looks like a short front diffuser. Then we can see a longer front diffuser and three strakes either side that could generate vortices to seal the side of the diffuser. At the back there are strakes again and the center is a flat plate like an F1. All in all we can say that the numbers they presented are impressive, but it remains to be seen if they can really deliver them. It would be great to see more details of the car. How do you like the SP Chaos? Let me know in the comments below.